And there you go, the session's being recorded because my hope, I think I mentioned this last time, is I'm gonna go ahead and put all of these recordings online if I possibly can through a YouTube channel. And that way, after we've had a session, you should be able to go back and see it. There's actually also another sinister, sinister purpose to it, which is I can have it captioned through YouTube. So that means that if you are listening to the video later on and thinking to yourself, what on earth is he on about? You can always look down at the captions and hopefully YouTube has been clearer than I am. We can hope. Uh, let's see. Recently, I've been playing Portal 2 again. <clears throat> My son likes to play puzzles and he likes puzzle games, so I thought he would be well, well-rounded if I exposed it to some Portal. Um, a lot of times I play Left 4 Dead 2, which is my personal favorite. It's a nice way to unwind. I started Bioshock at some point. Yeah, used to play T uh, TF2 a lot. But uh, once the... Uh, I don't want to sound like a snob, but once all of the public access folks got in for free, it ruined the neighborhood. I'm going to get myself in trouble one of these days. I was always more of a, uh, I was more of a sniper guy. I always liked sniper as a class. I tried to be good at spy, and something about it would cause me to always be noticed right off the bat. Oh, yeah, definitely like Valve. Uh, my first computer game actually was when a friend of mine said, hey, listen, here's this game that's still relatively new. You may not have really tried it. It's called uh, Half-Life 2. Try it on my computer. We'll play it together, and I'll take you through the story. And so we played Half-Life 2 together at his place. That was um, probably like 15 years ago. Probably 15 years ago. Nothing wrong with Animal Crossing. <laughs> uh, Haley, that usually is my problem. And this semester, it's I would like to play games, but I don't have time. Uh, you might be able to see some of the inane scribblings behind me. Well, that's me trying to work through some math problems that I'm trying to put together into a paper I can publish. All right, what have we got time-wise? Looks to me like basically it is time. Um, I'm going to check through and just see who's here and who's not really quick. Um, we're not going to worry about any kind of quiz questions or anything today. I know that this is kind of new to still some people, so I'd like to try and make sure that you have some time to adjust after day one, or if you didn't make it to day one, you know, you just got added, that you're able to adjust to the class, and we'll begin taking those sorts of questions probably, uh, probably next week. And I think that will be a pretty good way to make sure that things are figured out for everybody. Okay. <laughs> I see people saying, you're here. This is good to know. I can actually also see it. There's a, uh, a way that I can see who's joined the meeting. So if you're wondering if I can see if you're there, yes, I can. Okay, so the very first thing I want to do really quickly is just talk about how I'm envisioning these video quizzes, or excuse me, these video quizzes. I read the chat and it trips me up. Uh, I want to talk about how these video live sessions are going to go. So the way I picture things, basically what I'm going to do every single time is I'm going to open the floor to questions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the videos or the difficulty getting to the videos, uh, which I was hearing about earlier today. Then we'll move on to doing problems. We'll try some problems out and uh, we'll intersperse either a question or questions in the middle of the lecture from next week onward. So the big topic, of course, is that right now people were having difficulty getting to the lectures. And unfortunately, that is just a natural consequence of week one. Week one is kind of an odd time for uh, Canvas, for My Labs Plus, which you guys don't use, My Math Labs, which is still Pearson, so it's the same guys. They have exactly the same process. Um, we try to work around it as best we can. 
of the last time I checked, and your mileage may vary, but the last time I checked, the videos were actually up and running. Haley, I agree with that 100%. Pearson is... Well, Pearson can't trust Pearson. QQ more. <laughs> uh, Pearson products like My Math Lab, My Labs Plus, all those things are, um, I find, temperamental at best. And yeah, I've heard problems with that. Actually, I had my own brand of problems earlier when I was trying to work with my previous classes because I wanted to give them the recordings like I'm going to do for you guys. And um, Blackboard was telling me that there were no recordings ex for day one, which is a stinking lie. So it took a good 10, 15 minutes before everything cleared up. And now I can see it. So I guess the lesson to take away from that is it's a matter of time. Also, another lesson to take away from this is that if you can't hear anything, try rejoining. Okay. So let me ask you this. Does anybody have any questions so far? If you were able to watch the first video, which I apologize for right now, it has potato quality for audio and everything gets sorted out after video 1.1. Uh, but did you have any questions from the material you have been able to watch? Uh, Victor, go ahead and let me know what's up. Uh, mostly, so quest, the video questions for the video in general. I don't really have anything, but the but the quiz that was embedded in the first quest. Uh, when I went to review my answers, like the first question that came up that gives you, it kind of turned out blank in the results. So it says I got 50%, but it doesn't even tell you, tell me what the correct answer was for the first question. So, ah, uh, yes. And I'm not sure it's actually capable of doing that. So let's see, I can go and look up what that first question was, and then we'll take a look at that. Um, Erica, you had a question next. Uh, go ahead and tell me what's up while I'm looking this up. Sure. Um, so I was actually wondering if there was somewhere to print out your video lectures so that we can take notes while listening to the lecture. Um, you might be able to, but actually, you know what? Let me show you something while I'm right here. Okay. Um, so here you go. I am now in the class. You should hopefully be able to see it now. It looks like you can. If you scroll down now to week one, you'll notice the very top entry that you guys can see, which is what these little green marks mean, I can see a little bit more than you guys, is uh, MGF 1107 Chapter 1 PDF. Now, if you click on that and look at that, this is actually literally a slideshow that I put together for the entire chapter of Chapter 1. It contains all of the basic information from the chapter, minus all of the fluff, because this book tries to be accessible, but it does it by being fluffy. Everything is here, and this is the really great part. If you're hovering over any of these things in red, these are actually hyperlinks. So for example, if you are at the table of contents and you wanna to go to the fairness criteria and arrows and possibility theorem, click on that. And if you've downloaded it for sure, maybe not so much in this uh, document format, it will take you all the way to the end and let you read. Everything is here. There's space for you to write on. Uh, you can scribble all over it. So if you would like to, print this out uh, section by section and use this, and this would be a pretty good way to accomplish what you're asking for. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have one more question um, sure. regarding the uh, my math lab. So mm -hmm. um, since there were issues with the video lecture, I know that according to the syllabus, you were saying that um, everything cuts off and locks you out at noon, but you would get partial credit up until the exam. Will mm -hmm. there be a little bit of an extension since there were problems with the video? Um, to that depends. All that homework? Okay. That depends. So if you look at the schedule, I'm not going to pull the schedule up again for right now, but yeah. uh, the schedule is pretty relaxed the first couple of weeks because I knew that there were going to be problems like what we're experiencing now and I knew that there would be new people adding. So I've kind of tried to build in that leniency into the schedule itself. Now, if we move along, let's say to next week, and by next week, end of next week, 
uh, according to my schedule, everything should be well un in hand, and it's not for whatever reason, we can always r adjust the times. That's part of the reason why I've kept this as much as possible as a tentative schedule, because if something changes, and things are always changing in uh, USF and in this course, then we can always go back and we can try to figure out what was going on. Make it okay. better. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so the video is loading for me right now, Victor. Thanks for your patience. Uh, does anybody else have a question while the video is loading? Uh, Olivia, go ahead. Um, for chapter 1.2, the plurality method, Yes. When we're asked to find and like use the plurality method, do we assume that it's winner only unless it states to give the full ranking? That is a good question. Um, in MLP, what they should do is they should tell you what they want. Um, generally speaking, I'm going to ask you for full rankings, especially when we're doing problems here, because if you can do a full ranking problem, you can do a winner only problem. However, uh, there will be a few that are winner only. And when they are winner only, hopefully, hopefully uh, MLP should say something. And I can guarantee you that the exams are going to say explicitly what's supposed to be going on. Okay, so let me go ahead and move this over. So you're looking now at the video quiz for chapter 1.1 right now. This is basically what it looks like. Uh, hopefully you can see everything. It looks like you can from my screen. So looking at this, it's asking, what are the people, places, or things that can be selected between in an election? Hopefully you guys have all tried this, but I'll give you a second to think about it. And I'll answer Haley's question. So go ahead. Um, I'm confused about these video quizzes. Um, mm -hmm. When are they, so are they due? Because I looked on Canvas and they said they were due, like I think it's Monday. But are they actually due before our sessions? Generally speaking, they are going to be due before the sessions. However, because this week is such a turbulent week, since Canvas has a tendency to crash a little bit, since my math lab and my labs plus are all experiencing issues and everybody's still trying to figure out what's going on, I usually postpone the stuff for 1.1 and 1.2 to the next week so that, that way you have time to make sure you have access before everything is due all right okay thank you you're welcome okay and there was somebody after Haley. up oh, it's victor again victor what's on your mind yeah, yeah this is the quiz that i got and i selected my answer i'm not going to say which one just because i don't want to give away answers but when like the quiz review at the end, like when you finish the video, that first question, when you tells you like which correct answer, you, there was blank spaces for the answer you put in and then the answer that's correct. So I don't know hmm. if that had an impact on the 50, on why I got it 50%, but I just wanted to point that out because I got this quiz screen and I selected my answer and submitted it. But when I reached the end, it said that I didn't get anything. Okay, and that's really interesting. I don't know why it's doing that. that I'm going to go ahead and chalk it all up to Canvas being a mess right now. I'm allowed to do that because I am A, a professor, and B, a mathematician, so I cannot be wrong. It's literally a rule of the universe. But mm -hmm. assuming that I actually can be wrong, uh, the nice thing about these quizzes is I've made them so that you can take them over and over again. I'm going to post the videos elsewhere so that that way you don't have to always watch them with quiz questions. But... Until they close, you can watch them over and over again and retake the quizzes over and over again. So in a lot of ways, you basically get free credit for these as long as you are willing to go back and watch them and try them again. All right, I think I'll do that. I think that's a smart choice. It's the whole reason I did it that way, because I'm a super genius, me and Wiley Coyote. All right, so after Victor, who do we have? Victor, I'm going to put your hand down. Campbell, go ahead. Hi. Um, usually when I go to look to see what's due, I just go to the grades column on Canvas and going to go off what's due next. Is there stuff that's going to be outside of that that I need to do, or can I find all my assignments in the grades uh, place on Canvas? It should be all visible through grades. Um, 
I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't see something because luckily in this course, unlike uh, say pre-calculus, uh, my math lab integrates very nicely with Canvas. So everything that's due in my math lab should show up as an assignment in Canvas. Uh, that, that means that everything should be there. Now there is a little bit of uncertainty for me because uh, this course, I've taught this course now several semesters in a row, and I have backlogs of information from the previous times I've taught it. So I can see old assignments and I can see old stuff that I've done that used to be graded and now I'm not using, at least not currently, and I may have to change. I don't know if that shows up in your gradebook. Yes. If it does, it might make you a little confused. If not, then no worries. Okay, gotcha. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, after, okay, so that would be Leah. Go ahead, Leah. So if we wanted to redo a video quiz, can we like skip through the video just to the questions or does not count unless you like watch the whole video? To the best of my understanding, as long as you get all the way to the end, you answer all the questions and then you hit submit at the end, you can just go through question to question and that's it. Okay, um, cool. So if, you, if you've watched it already and you just want to try the questions again and get good answers and make sure you're right, then that's just fine. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to actually shift this off because there is a good point. Uh, there are answers that are still available to be asked, so I don't want to give things away. But before I do, um, I'm going to say Tavalian. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yeah. Say that one more time for me, please. Te Avion. Te Avion? Yes, sir. All right. What you got for me? So I, I heard you mention that you said um, you would post the videos on a YouTube channel. And I don't, I don't know if you said the name yet, but what was the name of the YouTube channel? Uh, I haven't said the name of it yet. Um, the YouTube channel, I will share it to Canvas, and I believe it should show up as Z Forest Lectures Blazing Saddle Points. Okay. Z so it should be really good. Z Forest Lectures, which is, what did you say at the end? I'll type it into the chat. It looks like Z Forest Lectures Blazing oh. Saddle Points. Okay. Thank like you. so. All right, and for those of you who are just joining us, and Tiavion, I'm gonna thank you. Good job, you anticipated me. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, if you could not uh, access the videos already, that is okay. Canvas has been having trouble. What you're seeing right now is what the video should look like if you'd made it through the first bit all the way through to the first question. Um, they should be accessible now. If I can get to them, you guys should be able to get to them too because of the way they've been posted. But if not, it's okay. We have until Monday to uh, try it again. So give it a little bit of time to sort out. I'll keep checking and making sure that it's uh, possible. And if not, I will see if I can fix it. I know there was some trouble with it last night, and I don't know why. Um Every once in a while, things get a little bit screwy, and the only way to know if it's screwy or not is to give it a try and see what happens. Okay, so what are some other questions? You guys have any other questions for me related to material? If not, I can always talk about some of the material freehand and let you guys follow along. Uh, actually, since I am, as aforementioned, a super genius, I might even be able to get the slideshow up in front of you guys so that you can see what I'm looking at when I look at the slideshow. It'll be almost like I'm making a video just for you guys. And in fact, I am. How cool is that? Let's see. Chapter one. Okay. So let's see if this pops up in front of you guys. Ah, there it is. All right. I'm going to have to shrink it just a little bit. There you go. All right. So in this section, the very first section is going to be nothing more or less than uh, terms and terminology. 
There are a few examples that are really useful in the basic elements of elections for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to watch through it. Uh, but that actually is important in and of itself. I believe I say this in the video, but this is worth saying over and over again in case somebody hasn't heard it. In mathematics, everything begins with a language. And I'm not just saying that for your guys' benefit. It's actually literally the truth. Um, not to go too too far into the history of mathematics, because that's not what this course is about all the way. But up until about the 20th century, what happened is mathematics was generally to be pretty self-evident and pretty obvious in a lot of senses. Not 100%. We still had things like proofs to be able to see what was true and what wasn't. But definitions and the languages of mathematics uh, were generally considered to be pretty easy to follow and pretty self-explanatory. When you made definitions, when you said things were true, they were workable. They were doable. And then sometime in the early half of the 20th century, along came a philosopher and logician and also mathematician named Bertrand Russell. And Bertrand Russell introduced something, which I'm actually going to write on the board in case you are interested in looking it up later. Uh, it's called, I believe, if you look it up, Russell's Paradox. Russell's paradox is actually a special form of something called the liar's paradox. And the liar's paradox is really easy. Uh, liar, a liar's paradox goes like this. Uh, if you have a person who only speaks truth and they say to you they are lying, how do you interpret their sentence? What is the logical value of their sentence? Are they telling the truth or are they lying at that point? And the thing is, if you start trying to take it apart, what you're going to find, Russell's is actually off the PDF. That's one of the reasons why I want to put it in front of you like so. Uh, if you start trying to go through the logic, you're going to find very quickly you're chasing your own tail. Because if you assume the person who always tells the truth is telling the truth, then they must be lying. But of course, if they're lying, they're not telling the truth, which is a contradiction. That's a logical contradiction. On the other hand, if you assume they are lying, then... They just said they're lying to you, which means that if they're lying about lying, they're telling the truth. In other words, they were telling the truth all along. However, we assumed they were lying. That's another logical contradiction. Russell's paradox is the same idea. It's a little bit more technical. It's a little bit less something that you can think about with your friends and buddies over a beer or two. But it is the same idea. Effectively, what happens is we take something to be true. We work through the consequences, and it turns out that if it's true, it must also be false. And if you try to work from the assumption it's false, the assumption it's false shows very clearly that it is true. And put together, it basically showed that everybody at the time who was using mathematics the way they were, were doing it too, too carelessly. So as a consequence of that, People called logicians went back in and they reworked mathematics from the ground up. And it went from being what we mostly see now to being a skeletal framework where you started out and you made a language of symbols. The symbols are very weird looking symbols. Uh, they're always things that look like, um, this is a logical statement here. Uh, for every fee in R and not phi equal to eta. And statements would look like this. And from those sorts of really weird looking, bizarre, symbolic languages, they built mathematics back up to what we have now. Nobody really uses this anymore except as shorthand notation. We definitely aren't going to be using it. I put it here just to make sure you guys have an idea of where I'm coming from. The important fact of the matter is, though, when you write language, when you write mathematics that way, at its core, we are introducing language and terminology that cannot be contradicted, that is definitely right or wrong one way or the other. It doesn't produce weird paradoxes like Russell's paradox. And as a consequence, we can all be safe in talking about it together. We know what we're talking about. We know that we're either all right or all wrong. There's no ambiguity. And as a consequence of that, we have to kind of start there whenever we want to talk about mathematics. We have to have a common language. So what we're going to do is look at some of those terms right here. 
The very first term I'm going to put in front of you guys is the idea of tabulating. Basically, it's just a fancy way of saying counting. Um, we use it whenever we're talking about elections. We tabulate results. And it's um, this is a major fact right here. Whenever you have an election going on, if we ran the election the same way every single time, except that in the midst of tabulating the votes, we changed how we count, we can really seriously alter the results of the election. If you use any of the voting methods we talk about in this chapter, what you're going to find is the same election can have wildly different results under every single one of these voting methods. And it makes things very, very complicated. And it throws them into doubt. Because if you can have the same election effectively and just change the way that we talk about counting the votes and getting a result, it raises some good questions. Things like, well, what are the different ways? Is there a best method? Are these methods fair at all? And we're going to try and answer that in this section. These are all really important questions. This year in particular, they're really important questions because, as we all know, we're going to be voting this year. So if we're going to be voting for things like, say, the president of the U.S., it would behoove us to know what the voting looks like, what goes into voting, and what reality is surrounding elections. I've got a bunch of terms here. I'm not going to really go through these. Um, they're already here for us to download and look at and take notes on. I'm just going to really quickly touch on them. So we're going to talk about people called candidates. Actually, candidates don't have to be people. They can be people, places, or things. So they're just basically nouns. And we're trying to decide between them in the election. People like you and me who are voting in the election are called voters. And it's important to know that voters change depending upon which election you are in. So, for example, in the presidential election, voters are going to be citizens of the U.S. Well, if we went to another election, for example, the election for the, uh, for the grading schema that we're going to be using for this class that's going to take place next week. First of all, the candidates aren't the same because the candidates aren't any more people who will be the president. They're grading schema that we're going to choose between. And second of all, the voters aren't the same. Folks in, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, Minot, Dakota, just to pick a place off the top of my head, they don't get a say in what we're doing unless they're enrolled in the class, which I don't think there is anybody from Minot enrolled in this class, which is uh, a good thing. Minot is not my favorite place on earth. Secondhand, not favorite place on earth. Um, that means that we also, you're from Minot, North Dakota. Is it your favorite place on earth? God bless. You know what? I did say you weren't allowed to mess with me first day, so I guess after the first day, it's fair game. I'm going to have to think about that one. This is dangerous. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing. And let's see, let's get some more terms here. Uh, ballots. Ballots are actually something I'm thinking about very strongly as this next week looms. Ballots are the ways that we record votes. And the real crucial piece of information about ballots is we need to make sure that ballots contain all the information that we want or need for an election. And that's basically what separates one ballot for another. Single choice ballots, for example. These guys, they really only cover your very first preference, at least the first preference you're willing to admit to on paper. Preference ballots. Preference ballots contain every single candidate, not just your first preference, but also your second place preference and your third place. A lot of times I'll say place. Uh, you can equivalently say rank. On the other hand, Trunk preference ballots are kind of like the mutant love child of the uh, single choice of preference. They have some of the candidates, but not all of them. Usually it's only the first two or three that we care about in those cases. Uh, another term that we have is outcome. Outcome basically just means the results of the election. What happens after we apply our voting method to the votes that were cast? And the very last one is the voting method itself. Ah, I'll let you guys read over the different types of outcomes here, but they're usually pretty self-explanatory. Voting methods are really the things I want to talk about because voting methods are what we care about in the election. Um, once we fix things like ballots and once we fix things like who the voters are and who the candidates are, voting methods are what really make the difference. 
Now, I'm sure you could make an argument and say that there are other things that really matter to an election, that not just the pieces we've introduced in definitions aren't the only important things, and you would be right, for sure. Um, you could also make an argument a, a little bit more in particular for our case that I'm saying that things like the outcome, the outcome matters, but once we figured out how we're going to measure the outcome, we don't care about it so much anymore. Uh, ballots matter. We know there are different types of ballots, but once we fix those, it doesn't really matter anymore. And you may say to me, well, that's a little bit flippant. Those things are real considerations. <clears throat> What we choose in those situations, uh, the differences between the different ballots, the different outcomes, they all matter. And you're not wrong. You are 100% correct. But the problem is this. A lot of information that goes into a voting is very, very chaotic by its nature. Because let's be real here. When we talk about elections, we're not talking about, I don't know, an election of centipedes. We're not talking about centipedes voting on things. We're not talking uh, about something that's logical and predictable. We're not talking about things that we kind of think we have a grasp on. We're talking about people, and people are really weird. I'm a person. I'm going to raise my hand right now. I'm really weird. If you're a person and you're weird, raise your hand in the chat or type F. <laughs> See? Exactly. We're all weird. We all know we're weird. That changes the nature of the election. If we try and look at things from all of the human side of things, things like preferences, things like uh, uh, whether or not we have the ability to even go out and vote that day, maybe weather changes, whether or not we have access to our polls and things like that, then all of a sudden we're introducing so much complexity that actually this class wouldn't even be able to talk about it. We'd be in the realm of things like statistics and probability, stochastic mathematics. And while that is okay for people who are doing that, we don't need to think of it that way. If we narrow our focus down to voting methods, we have something we can work with. And so that's what we're doing for this class. I also list a bunch of examples in this section. Uh, these are basically picked directly from the book. You may find that some of them are more interesting than others. So we have here the Academy Awards. I kind of give an idea of what goes on in the Academy Awards. But as we all know, those of us who watched BoJack Horseman, there's a shady, shady business going behind it. So we don't actually know full details. Uh, the Heisman Trophy is in here. This has a few more details because this one definitely is a little bit more open to the general public. We can kind of see what's going on a little bit better. Uh, this one actually is one where we know even the method that's being used. It's something called board account, which is talked about in section 1.3. American Idol is a really weird example. The book loves this example for American Idol. And the reason why is because American Idol is just a very unusual election. Most elections, like the presidential election coming up this year, are very straightforward in how you vote. There's a ballot. There are places that you go fill out your ballot. You turn your ballot in. You're done. You're, you finished. You are a voter still, but your vote has been cast. In American Idol, by contrast, you can cast a vote over and over and over again, and you don't even have to cast it for the same person. So that makes American Idol, in some ways, a really fascinating example of elections. We're not really going to focus on it because we're not super interested in these examples. We're more interested in examples like this one. So these are all the ballots for a fictitious election that takes place at TSU. So I'd like to see a show of hands right now if you would like to have the chance to be able to go through every single one of these ballots one by one, record the results of the election, and then try to count everything up. If you would like to do that, step forward, because I can guarantee you I don't want to do that. Yeah, that's going to be a hard pass, right? That's because we are looking at these ballots, and there is tons of information in these ballots. And there's 37 ballots here. Maybe that's not going to be a lot of ballots overall. I mean, we know that... This year, there's going to be maybe hundreds of millions of ballots cast. But just because there's more of ballots in one election doesn't mean we want to count ballots in this election. 
So the question becomes, in a situation like this where we've got a bunch of information and it's all there in front of us, but we don't want to count it all, is there a way that we can kind of neck that information down into something that's a little bit easier and more compact to read? And the answer for that is yes, there is, but we have to be careful about how we do it. So now I have uh, some formulas. This is the most mathy part of this very first section. There are formulas here that we're going to look at, and I'm going to take some time to explain them since we've got the time today. It'll be a nice stand-in for being able to do problems as if you guys had watched the videos. The very first thing I want to draw your attention to is this term right here. Assume that there are n candidates. I use terminology like this a lot. When I say there are n candidates, what I mean is n is a positive whole number. And actually, there are ways to shorten that. Sometimes you may actually hear me say instead, n is greater than or equal to 1. That means exactly the same thing. It basically says it's going to be greater than 1, so it's definitely positive. And when you see something like this, mathematically, it's a shorthand for saying, I want it to be a whole number. The other way that I might say it sometimes, if not careful, and you guys can feel free to stop me and ask me what I'm saying if I say it, is I can write this. Symbolically, this statement right here, actually, symbolically, all these statements right here are all the same thing. They mean exactly the same. N is a positive whole number. I'll try to avoid writing this out again and again and again, but if you need a reminder, that's what I'm saying when I write these things. Okay, so I have N candidates in the election. All we know is that N is a whole number, uh, so that means there's at least one candidate, and I'm going to go ahead and take a stab and say that in most elections, we probably have more than two candidates. If that happens, that we are in this election with N candidates, and we have a winner-only outcome for our election, then there's only N distinct possible ballots. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say N equals 3. This will be a pretty good example. So that means that we have candidates... Uh, let's go ahead and just refer to them by A, B, and C. So, if we're doing, if we are doing a winner-only outcome, and specifically, actually, this is another important piece of information I put here, we're doing single-choice ballots. I may correct this when I put this online again. I may do a corrected, a corrected version of it. then all you're going to be asked to do is put your favorite candidate, your first place preference, on your ballot, and that's it. So how many different uh, possibilities are there? Well, there's A, there's B, or there's C. So that would be three choices. Three possible distinct ballots. You'll notice I keep using the word distinct here. When I say distinct, what I mean is they're different from one another. They are not the same ballot. Because uh, let's say that Matthew here, with his cool Terminator Reagan picture and I both vote, uh, we could both vote for A as our top preference. And technically, we both have our own ballot. But when you look at our two ballots, they have the same information on them. So from our perspective, or from the perspective of whatever machine or person is tabulating votes, there's really no difference between our ballots. On the other hand, let's say that Angela, the next person up in the chat, voted for B. Well, Angela didn't vote for A, so her ballot is obviously and immediately different, distinct, from mine and Matthew's. So that means that from the standpoint of whoever's counting the votes, Angela's ballot and Matthew and my ballots are distinct ballots, but Matthew and my ballots are not distinct from one another. And that's kind of a crucial piece of information. Now that one's pretty easy. So of course in a situation where things are easy in mathematics, what's the very first thing I do? 
who wants to take a stab at the very first thing I'm going to do now that I have an easy uh, easy case? Naturally, I'm going to make it difficult. So we have the next one. So if I am doing a full ranking, and in this case, I need to also go ahead and put here, meaning that we're using preference ballots. Then there are n factorial, that's how we say this, different possible distinct ballots. And how do you get n factorial? Well, you use this weird looking formula. I want to do an example of that. So let me see, do I actually have an example written out in here? I don't think so. No, I think I just introduced a new formula. So let me go ahead and do an example for you guys really quick. Let's suppose that we make an, I don't know, what's your favorite number? And this time, don't type it in the chat. Go ahead and put it in the video because my voice is lovely. But you know what? It's nice every once in a while to have a little bit of difference. So somebody give me your favorite number, N. Four. Four. Four is good. Okay, so let's say N equals four in our example. There are four candidates, and what we're doing is we're asking voters to come in and fill out a full preference ballot, meaning that since there are candidates A, B, C, and D, let's call them, when you come in as a voter, you're going to put one of those four first, then you're going to put another of the four second, and then another third, and then the last one in fourth place. So I'm going to act for a second like I don't have this formula. Uh, Let's say I was trying to choose my first place candidate. How many different options are there right now for choosing my first place candidate? There are four. Why are there four? Well, I look at my four different candidates I can choose between. I pick one of those four, but I could have picked any of those four. I'm at liberty to pick any of them. You might be Haley, but that is okay. So there are four ways to pick the first one. Okay, so now I've picked my first place candidate. Let's play, pick the second place. Now, how many ways are there to pick the second place candidate? Now there's three. There are three ways to pick the second place candidate because obviously I've already picked my first. So I've already eliminated one of them. Say A was my first place candidate. I can't pick A for second place anymore. I have to pick one of the remaining three. All right, so if I then pick the third place candidate, how many ways are there to do that? And then that means that when I get down to the fourth place candidate, there must be only one. See, you guys have already got this. Uno, uno más. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. All right. Now, this is a nice little counting principle that I'm going to introduce to you right now. If I'm trying to do a task, any task, in this case, the task is count the number of possible ballots, uh, but it can be any task where I'm trying to count the number of ways to do something. And if I can break that task down into pieces, and I know how much each of the pieces are, if I have to do the piece number one first, and then I have to do piece number two second, and then I have to do piece number three third, and so on until I run out of pieces to do, the total number of ways to do the overarching task, the big task, is the number of ways to do task one times the number of ways to do task two times the number of ways to do task three and so on and so forth. And in our case, what that means is I multiply four times three times two times one, which is exactly what somebody was putting into the chat just a second ago. So you deserve a golf clap. Don't let it go to your head. Great kid, don't get cocky. Let me quote Star Wars today. And if you look, this is exactly four factorial. 
If I look at the formula for 4 factorial, or if I look at the formula for factorial, the first piece of my multiplication should be n, which in our case is 4. We've got that. The next piece should be n minus 1. Well, that's 3. We've got that. Then 2. Then eventually all the way down to 1, and we're finished. And as somebody has already figured out, when you multiply that all together, that means there are 24 distinct possible ballots for us. This is nice. Now you'll notice that 4 factorial is 24. So let me ask you this question, and I'm going to ask somebody, some poor schmuck, to answer me verbally. What happens if I let, and I'm going to use a different color here to remind us all of something new. What happens if I let n be 5? How much is 5 factorial, the number of possible distinct ballots when there are 5 candidates? Sybil, go ahead. Is it 120? It is 120. So take a stab. What happens if there are six possible candidates instead of five? Seven twenty. Seven twenty. Yeah. Seven twenty is a huge number. And you can see how quickly these things go up. We haven't even reached ten yet, and we've got numbers that are in the multiple, multiple hundreds. That kind of tells us a couple things. The first thing is there are lots of distinct ballots if you are not careful about how many different candidates you have. For our class, that's not going to be an issue. But if you can imagine an election where there were, let's say, 20 different candidates to vote between, that would be 20 factorial distinct ballots if we are doing full ranking and preference ballots. That's an unpleasant number of people to try and tabulate and work through. So we're going to stick away from that. We are going to run from that like the plague. I also have another formula here that I've, I, I've included mostly for completeness sake, and that is usually called the selection formula. We usually pronounce this as n select k. Or n permute k. Those are both equally valid ways to read what this formula says. And you'll notice that it actually is comprised of two different uh, factorial formulas. One of them is n factorial here on top. The other is down here on the bottom, n minus k factorial. And so when you do n minus k factorial, and I've indicated that here, that means you do the factorial formula, but your first term is n minus k, and the next one is next term smaller, and then so on and forth all the way down. We're not going to be using that so much. I mostly include that for completeness sake because you do use that sometimes. Uh, Alyssa, don't worry about it. I am actually not taking attendance today. I'm going to take it generally, but since this is week one and we've already done our uh, attendance quiz for first day, I'm going to hit you guys with that again next week, but next week we'll actually do questions during class. So you are totally fine. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. If you guys would like to have more information about this selection formula, if you're interested in the counting problems, because they can be quite interesting, you're welcome to talk to me. But for the time being, I'm going to assume that you're not super interested in that, and I'm going to move along. But I'm also going to open the floor for questions right now. So if anybody has a question you've been holding on to, hit me with it. Angela, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't realize my well, mic wasn't on. That's okay. Watch the videos before class because it's the whole thing. But I wanted to ask, so if it's full ranking, can it also be like single choice or it's always going to be preference ballots? Um, it's going to, full ranking. That's a good question. And the answer is it would have to be uh, full preference ballots because the fact of the matter is if you only allow the first place candidate to be noted down in your ballot, what that means is we wouldn't even know who your second place preference was. So we wouldn't be able to use that information to figure out who was the next ranked person, at least not most of the time. Um, okay, so but <clears throat> can winner only also be preference ballots? It can be. Actually, we're going to do at least one example in the, the videos where we do winner only, but I use preference ballots. 
Uh, the reason for that, and we are kind of getting there, we'll get to it basically at the end of today, is that when you are dealing with these, um, when you're dealing with ballots and trying to tabulate your results, the easiest way to make sure that you have all of your information is to put them in something called a preference schedule. And preference schedules are kind of worthless if we only have a single choice ballot. So we usually assume that everybody was given uh, either a preference ballot or they were given a truncated preference ballot and the results are being shown in our table. But we'll come to that in a minute. <clears throat> so Gabriella, I see you have a question. Unless it's pronounced Gabriella, I'm sorry. It's Gabrielle, um, but I don't know. I'm not sure if I missed it, but for the first example, I see we got 24 and we didn't do the times two times one. Um, is that because we don't have to do times two times one to every problem? Um, we do have to do times two and times one. Um, the thing is, if you're looking at, say, the one here, if I multiply by one, what does that actually do to my answer? Does it change anything? No, it keeps it. Exactly. So I actually don't worry about using the times one mostly. It's mostly there just to tell us where to stop. The things that really matter are the four, the three, and the two. So if I do four times three, I get 12. If I do 12 times two, I get 24. And that's how I get my answer. I don't even worry about this last part. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I actually have an example here. The example is one that we've already worked out. It's talking about the TSU Math Club, and it says that since there are four distinct candidates, uh, we want to find out how many distinct ballots there can be if we use full ranking. In other words, and I definitely am going to have to correct this a little bit later, in other words, that means we're using preference ballots, which I'm just going to note as pref ballots because I don't want to keep on writing forever. But we already know the answer to this. The answer is just four factorial. We calculated that a second ago. So it turns out that there are 24 distinct ballots. <clears throat> now, the question is, why do I care about the number of ballots here? A second ago, before we got into these counting problems, what I said is we were going to try to take the information that we saw in problems like the TSU Math Club, and we were going to try to bottleneck it down a little bit. We were going to try to restrict how much we had to look at and make all the information available, but a little bit more easily. Well, I want to draw your attention to something. There are at most four, 24 different types of ballots that you could receive. It could be A first, B second, C a third, D fourth. It could be A first, C second, B third, D fourth. It could be so on and so forth. If you count all of them, there's only 24. But how many different voters were there in the TSU Math Club election? So that is a good question. How many were there voting in this election? Well, if we backtrack, and or if we look at the chat, there were 37 people who were voting, 37 different preference ballots. In other words, skipping forward again really quick, what we have found out is the following. Number of distinct ballots is less than number of voters. Um, and I'll be posting this to YouTube as quickly as possible. There will be an announcement about it. So let me ask you. What can I, what kind of uh, information can I get from this? If I know that in the TSU Math Club example, there are more voters than there are distinct ballots, what does that tell us about this election? What do we know about some of the, the ballots that we're receiving? And I am definitely looking for somebody to take a stab. There's going to be the same results for some of the ballots. Exactly. And I think I also saw that in the chat. There are going to be duplicates. Some people are going to have exactly the same ballot as some other people. So here's a thought. 
if I could take all of these different ballots and I could put some of them into a little tray over here, and this would be the tray for ballots of type one, let's say, and then I have a tray for ballots of another type, let's say of type two, and I put them all over here together, stacked, because they all have the same results, and I just keep doing that for different ballots that are all identical to one another, even though they came through different voters, that would cut down on a lot of information that I would have to keep track of. Because if I know what the ballot looks like, even the top ballot for pile one, I know what all the other ballots in that pile look like. So I just need to know what the top one looks like and the number of ballots in that pile. And the same goes for pile two. If I know what the top ballot looks like and I know how many ballots there are, I know everything I need to know about the ballots in that pile. Well, if I take that idea and run with it, this is the information that we had just a second ago, we can make what's called a preference schedule. I'm going to show you a preference schedule rather than dwell too much on the definition I've got here. Here's the preference schedule for the TSU Math Club. If you take a look, they've done exactly what I was suggesting. They took all the ballots that put A first, B second, C third, D fourth, put them into one pile together, and there were 14 of them. That pile is represented by the very first column in our table. There are 14 people who voted this way. They voted A first, B second, C third, D fourth. Then they moved on to pile number two. There are 10 people who voted that way. C was first, B second, D third, and A fourth. And they just keep doing this. Every single one of these piles is its own column in the table. This table represents everything that's going on in the election for the TSU Math Club, but we don't have to actually look at the ballots. Who's more comfortable looking at this table than they were at looking at all the ballots that we had before? Show of hands. Yeah, exactly. I saw a sneaky F in there. I'll allow it. This is a much better situation than what we had before. With something like this, we might actually be able to humanly do this. In fact, all of our information from now on is really going to be given in preference schedules. I do not like to give you problems where you have to organize things in the preference schedules because it's easy, but it's tedious. And it takes time. And there's no reason to test you on your time management skills any more than is absolutely necessary. I think that is just silly. You're going to be doing that enough in your classes anyway. The great thing is we also have more things that the preference schedule does for us. <laughs> Don't worry, Haley. I believe in you guys. It's a learning curve, but everybody figures it out. So the first thing is we figure out the number of actual distinct ballots from one another. So, for example, to kind of clarify what I said right there. And no, you won't have to assemble a table yourself. The book has some problems where it lets you practice, and the homework might have something, although that seems a little bit unnecessary. But it is not hard. All you have to do is exactly what we talked about here, and I won't test you on it. Uh, but to go back to the first of the pieces of information you can glean, if we go back to the example, ah, and this is really cool. I can just kind of click on the example here, and it should take me back. Yeah, that's what I call cool. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, when I look at the table, what it's telling me is the ballots in this first pile that are represented by column one, they're not distinct from one another, but they are distinct from the ballots in every other column. The ballots in column two, they're all the same, but they're distinct from the ballots in every other column. So effectively, what that means is there are only one, two, three, four, five distinct types of ballots in this election. And that's handy for us. It's what's really allowed us to look at this information without having to resort to a new hobby like competitive drinking. The next thing is it tells us wh who are the candidates in the election. So if you go back and look at that example, you know that the candidates in the election are A, B, C, and D. There is no ambiguity about who they are. The last thing it tells you is the number of voters who participated in the election. It says here to add the number, the numbers displayed in the top row altogether. So let's go ahead and do that really quick. We might as well. So if I come back here, it says here in the top row, I had 14 who voted like the guys in column one, 
10 in the next, 8 in the next, 4 in the next, and then we finally get our result on the end. So what I'm going to do is just add all those things together. I had to find my handy dandy calculator. This is actually what the 30x2s looks like for those of you wondering. So if I do 14 plus 10 plus 8 plus 4 plus 1, I get 37 back. It's amazing. It's almost like we had that information from the beginning. Most elections, you won't have that information from the beginning. You'll just have a preference t uh, schedule. And so then what you have to do is actually find it yourself. And it is useful information because, after all, some of these are going to require us to calculate things like a majority. And you can't calculate majority unless you know how many people were in the election to begin with. Ah, here we are. All right, and the very last thing I have to talk about today, and we're basically out of time, so we can answer questions after that for anybody who's interested. Oh, well, no, actually, we do have a little bit more time. I can always do more stuff if you guys want to do more. The last thing from Section 1.1 that I discuss is tiebreakers. Now, I'm not super concerned about tiebreakers, um, but there are lots of different ways that you can break a tie. The book mentions a lot of them right here on page nine. If you go in there, you can find examples that range from the really simple, like two people had a tie, so they each draw a card from the deck, and the person with the higher value card is the one who wins the election, all the way up to having to redo elections over again in order to get new results. Um, all of them are possible, but we're not super worried about them in this class. There are some problems in MLP that will ask you to do a tiebreaker, but the important thing is this. Anytime you need to do a tiebreaker, the problem, whether I give it to you or whether the uh, MLP, whether I give it to you or whether the homework gives it to you, which is MML, I must be clear about that. It is my math lab, not my labs plus. It is going to tell you very clearly what the tie-breaking method is. It might give you any number of ways to break the tie, but it's going to say to you very clearly, this is the way we break ties. All right. So I'm going to stop for a second and let you guys ask me questions before I do anything else. We can do a little bit of stuff from uh, section 1.2 today if you want, since we do have a little bit more. But before I do that, the floor is open. Ask away. Caitlin. Hi, so I was just wondering, because I saw that the video lecture is due Monday, which I did, so I was wondering, like, for our next meeting, which videos we should watch. Like, do we need to watch all the way up to 1.4, or is there, like, a certain way you're doing that? Um, so what we're going to do, basically, is we're going to have to adjust the schedule a little bit since we're having trouble with Kaltura, with a Canvas. Um, I will have to announce what we're going to do. My first thinking is that probably, um, feel free, Jessica, probably what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take questions from 1.1 and 1.2, if necessary, on Monday. And then we'll also have you guys watch the videos for, uh, up to that. Uh, what section is are we supposed to be talking about on Monday? I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, on the calendar, it says 1.1 is due Monday, and then the Okay, I'll have to um, I'll have to look at it. But what I would say is this: if in the schedule what it says to you is we're going to be uh, talking about chapter four in class, let's say chapter one point four, then assume that what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to uh, have you guys watch to the video of material that we're supposed to be talking about that day. We may run out of time. We may have to talk about other things that day as well. But if the, it says in the, the syllabus, we're talking about 1.4 that day, assume that you should watch up to 1.4. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Emily, go ahead. What does it mean when it's highlighted in red on the, the schedule? Uh, in the schedule, the red highlight means that it's subject to change. I think I actually put that at the bottom of the schedule. So, for example, I think one of the days this week, uh, we were supposed to talk about something, and uh, there was a section, maybe 1.3, highlighted in red. 
Well, that means that I was hoping to get through 1.3, but if there was a change, as indeed there is going to have to be, then what we could always do is we could slide that section to the next class meeting and we'll review it then instead. Black entries mean that we're definitely doing them that day. Red means we may have to push them to the next meeting. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to lower hand. So since we have a few minutes left, I'm going to briefly touch upon the next section's worth of material, which is chapter uh, 1.2. That is plurality method. The plurality method is summed up in this definition. You'll notice that some of these definitions get to be a little bit long. None of them are hard. I'm just trying to make sure I cover everything in them. But it's easier if you listen to how I describe them. In plurality method, what happens is how, whatever sort of ballot you're using, whether you're using preference ballots, whether you're using single choice, you vote for your top preferences and anybody else. The votes are collected through ballots and then tabulated. The candidate who receives the first most first place votes, that candidate is going to be the winner of the election. If we are going to be doing a full or a partial ranking, then we continue on, and the second place candidate is going to be the candidate with the second most first place votes. And the candidate in third place is going to be the candidate with the third most first place votes. In other words, plurality method only cares about the number of first place votes you get. And I think we have enough time to do maybe one example. So let's do one example. It'll be in the video for those of you who had to leave, and we'll stop there for today. So what I'm going to do anytime that I'm working with plurality method is I come in and write everything down uh, that I need to to keep track of the number of votes per people. For me, that means at minimum I need all of the different candidates in the election, A, B, C, and D. And typically, since we're only counting first place votes, I don't worry too much about bookkeeping lots of information. All I do is I check out the table, I count up the number of first place votes for each candidate, and then I write the total here. So, for example, if you look for A's first place votes, I see that A appears first place in column one, but never again does A appear in first place, not for any other pile. So that means that A gets precisely 14 first place votes. If I move on to B, similar situation, B appears in first place here in column that appears to be four, four times. I gave away answers for the entire class, Ariana, so unfortunately, you're going to have to do it the hard way. Everybody else, they get to skateboard on a river of money, fame, and fortune. Or really not that much, and it'll be covered in the YouTube video. One of those two. <laughs> yeah, you and me both, Haley. Uh, okay, so let's see. Candidate C. Well, if I look at candidate C over here, oh dear, my computer is doing some kind of weird glitchy stuff. Give me one second. It might cut out for a second and come back. Do to do. Yep, Skynet taking over the world, stopping us from voting in the elections. Now you know who really hacked the DNC back in 2016. Okay, so as I was saying before, we were so rudely interrupted by AI. If we were trying to find the number of first place votes for C, we would look at, well, let's see, the first row, and I see that in the first row, C appears twice, once in column two, and a second time in column, what is that? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. C gets 10 first place votes from column two. And then C gets another one from the last column. So that means that C gets a total of 11. And D appears precisely once here in column three for eight first place votes. So at this point, if we were trying to do a full ranking... First place would have to go to A, obviously. Second place would go to C. 
third place would have to go to D, and fourth place would have to go to B. Nice and simple. This is really kind of a nice, straightforward way of doing things. As you can see, it took basically nothing at all to make sure that we got everything out for us. Excuse me, I wanted to check that I was still recording after that little hiccup. So here's my question for you. This was a really easy method. Could you conceivably have something wrong from it just from the knowledge that we have right here, that it's quick and easy to use? What do you guys think? Hmm. Well, I don't hear a lot of activity, so I'm going to voice my opinion. Split voters? Ah, yeah, that's a possibility. I think you mean split voters that... Ah, I can repeat the question, sure. So my question is this. We just did an election quickly and easily <clears throat> using the plurality method. The question becomes, if all we know about plurality is it seems to be quick and easy, what are some possible problems that we could figure out just from that information and from the results of this election? I see that Emily right there is noting the fact that a majority of people didn't vote for A. And that is definitely true. A majority of people did not vote for A, although one thing to point out here is that we don't yet know what a majority is. Uh, now, we happen to know from last section that there are 37 people. And with 37 people around, we know majority, if we're going to go fast and loose with the definition, basically means more than half. Half of 37 is really 38.5. So in reality, that works out to mean that a majority... Majority has got to be 19 votes, right? So definitely A does not have a majority of first place votes, even though they won. And that is a little bit weird that majority didn't vote them in. Uh, Gabrielle, you're 100% right. A vote could be messed up, although that's one of those complicated real life circumstances that I was talking about. We don't really know whether or not that's happened, and it's hard to say. We can put technology in place to try and help us figure it out, but... We're going to assume for right now in this class that the voting itself was flawless in terms of how it was recorded. The information is accurate to the best of the ballot's abilities. So we're going to focus on other stuff. Now, uh, Neva, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, so for posterity I am uncertain. Uh, Neva's got a really good point here, and that is we don't know if the people who voted for A were telling the truth. That's another really big possibility. Just because I've said that a person is the preference for me, the first place preference, that doesn't mean they really have to be. Neva, okay, thank you for the correction. I appreciate that. But as Neva was saying, it's totally possible that one of these voters could have looked at the election, thought to themselves and said, I know that Person A, I believe they're Alicia, according to our previous example information, is the most popular person overall. They're probably going to win. The other person who might win is C, who I'm just going to call Carlisle for right now, although that's probably not their real name. I don't like Carlisle. I like Alicia much better. I would prefer that Alicia wins, even though I don't want her to win. So I'm going to vote for Alicia. If they did that, we wouldn't know it because that's not what our ballots say. Our ballots don't say, what is the truth? Tell us the truth. And even if they did, we couldn't enforce it. All we know is what the person wrote down. So it's totally possible that this election was thrown off by people not voting sincerely. And I talk about it in the video, but to give you a quick summary that will be basically the end, when we vote insincerely, the problem is that there are consequences to it. The first consequence, the most obvious one is, if the person that you voted into first place actually does win, you're probably not getting the candidate you really want. They may be 
they may be preferable to an alternative, but that doesn't mean you want them to be the candidate who wins the election, and that's kind of a problem. The other thing is, let's say that there is a two-party system in place. Let's say that Alicia and Carlisle are just weird, sad has-beens who hang around the TSU math club year after year because they have nowhere better to go in life. Uh, we're going to take a moment to let you guys go, aw, that's so sad, off video, off camera from me. Let's say that they're around all the time, and they are always the two people that it really comes down to, that everybody else is basically, uh, they're a new person, and they don't really have much chance of winning. If, as a voter in this election, I go in knowing that either Alicia or Carlisle is more, most likely to win the election, and I vote for one of them based upon who I like the most of the two and not who I really want to win, all I'm really doing over and over again is reinforcing that two-party divide between Alicia and Carlisle and ensuring that they stick around and uh, talk over everybody else and stink up the room with their weird old person vibes. That's not such a big deal necessarily in the TSU math club, but in real life, that is not ideal. I also noticed that there are some other ideas being thrown out there, and this will be the last things I say before we close the session for today. Amanda notes that A won the election, but A is voted last by every other person. That's a really good point. If A was voted last by almost everybody, by actually more than a majority, should they really be the person who wins? And on the other hand, if we look at, say, B, and Isaac pointed this out, B right here was voted not first place that frequently, but they were voted second place very consistently. Why shouldn't they win if they are preferred so highly for second place? Maybe they would be a really good candidate to win. Who knows? <laughs> and yeah, I guess uh, technically, uh, Vlad, that this could be one of the reasons why we get more years of Putin. But I think we also know other reasons why Putin might stay in power. <laughs> We know them. We won't necessarily talk about them. I value not being poisoned very highly. I like being in my day without being poisoned. Cough, cough, relevant. All right. And I see a bunch of people commenting and saying they need to leave, and it is really at the, t uh, the end of our time. So I think... Political side comments have to come to an end. Video has to come to an end, and this will be it for today. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording in just a second. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Hopefully, these cannabis issues are going to clear up, and then at that point, we can move on to newer and better things once we get into next week. Uh, until then, happy math.